thank you for the gift of your word, especially the Easter word. And we pray that it would speak life to us as we hear it and live it and come to believe it in Christ's name. Amen. There's this uh, magician who had a gig working a cruise ship. And uh, he's pretty good, too. Did a lot of amazing tricks. And part of his act, he had a parrot, trained parrots to work with. And most of the time, the parrot did a pretty good job. But one evening, for whatever reason, the parrot was in a bad mood or something. And the, the magician did this great trick. He made something disappear, and the audience was starting to clap. And the parrot said, he stuck it up his sleeve. And the magician said, shh. And he did another trick, and the audience was amazed. And the parrot said, it's in his pocket. And he said, shut up, shut up, shut up. And then one more trick. And, and, the, and the parrot yelled out, he shoved it in his jacket. And the magician said, that's it. And he went over and he grabbed the parrot by the neck, and he started to strangle it. And right at that very moment, the cruise ship hit an iceberg and sank. And there was chaos everywhere, and it ended up the magician floating on a board in the middle of the ocean. The magician was on one end of the board, and the parrot was on the other end. And they just stared at each other for a long time. And finally, the parrot said, okay, I give up. What'd you do with the ship? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really why I'm leaving. I'm running out of jokes. Uh, <laughs> we are here today because something amazing has happened. Uh, something magical has happened. There was a body that was supposed to be in a tomb, and it was not there. And it was not up anybody's sleeve. It was not stuck in anybody's pocket. Uh, but he was alive. And, and every year when I preach on Easter, I always think it would be so great if we were hearing this story for the first time. Uh, I, mean, I don't even remember when I heard this story for the first time. But if we were hearing it for the first time today, that would really be something. But, but even though we all have heard this a thousand times before and we all know how this story goes, let's, let's, let's look at it one more time and see why this really is a magical, amazing, incredible story. Mary Magdalene is going to the tomb and she is crying. She is heartbroken. She's uh, sad. She's confused. And uh, the reason why we need this story is because we all end up right there. Sooner or later, that's where we all end up at some time in our lives. Uh, I was thinking about uh, time several years ago. I had to do a funeral, and uh, Holden was just a little guy. He was about six or seven, something like that. And I had to bring Holden with me. I don't remember why, but nobody to watch him. I had to bring Holden to the funeral home with me, and uh, I gave him a, you know, a tablet of paper to draw on, and there were some church people there that he could sit with, and he did just fine. But after the funeral, we were going home, and I could tell that he was thinking about something. I could see the, the wheels turning in there. And he said, Dad, he said, that was weird back at that place. He said, I saw people crying. And he said, I saw grown-ups crying there. Amazing. It blew his mind. I brought it up to him the other day, and he still remembered it. He thought, you know, you got to a certain age, and you became Iron Man, and you don't have any alleys anymore, and you can just have a big garage sale and get rid of all your Band-Aids and all your Kleenexes. You don't need them anymore, but that's not true. We all end up there. We all end up there. Sooner or later, we all have to deal with death, either the death of someone we love or our own death. And if we haven't gotten there yet, we will. And uh, that's, that's I, something that I have to believe that every human being wrestles with sometime in their life. You know, what? what is this? death thing. What's the deal with that? When I die, is that going to be the end of the Mike Rayfold show? I kind of liked the Mike Rayfold show, but uh, the mortality rate in this country is still 100%, and 
Sooner or later, we have to deal with the fact that we're not always going to be here. Easter's answer to the problem of death is resurrection. Or the Gospel of John likes to call it eternal life. Uh, and, and here's the thing about that, though. We all picture it the same way. Uh, we all have the same image there. We always picture it sitting on a cloud and playing the harp forever. Right? Sounds awful. Sounds terrible. I've said this before. If I die and I go somewhere and somebody hands me a harp, I'm going to start wondering about where I am. Uh, it's not enticing. But if you, look at the, if you look at the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, and you see how the Bible describes eternal life, which it doesn't do a lot, but when it does, most of the time the Bible describes eternal life as being a party. That's sounding a little better. And not just any party, but as a wedding party. Now, back in Bible times, people did not save up their money to send their kids to college. In the Bible times, people saved their money for their kids' wedding. And their wedding parties were not like ours, where we just eat some cake and do the electric slide and go home and wear our least comfortable shoes. Their weddings lasted seven days. And they would go all out. There would be all kinds of food. There would be all kinds of wine. There would be music. There would be dancing. They would whoop it up. It was the best time in any of these people's lives. And that's how the Bible describes eternal life. Um, we, a lot of us love stories about like near-death experiences or people that were dead for just a minute and they come back and they've seen things and I think there's a movie that came out this weekend called Heaven's for Real about a little boy's near-death experience and uh, I'll tell you my favorite story of these um, my, my, my own favorite real quick this is a true story it happened to a friend of mine another pastor that I know her father got sick bad sick in fact, he was in critical condition, and the hospital called all the family in, said, you better come in, say your goodbyes. It's not going to be much longer. And so they all came around, uh, but somehow the old man rallied. That happens sometimes, uh, and he got a little bit better. And in fact, he got to go back home. And he was still bed fast, and he still slept most of the time, but he was home. And every day at noon, his wife would make herself lunch, you know, just a little sandwich or something, and she would go into her husband's room and sit at the foot of his bed and eat in there. You know, still better than eating alone, right? And one day she was sitting in there eating her lunch, and her husband opened his eyes, and he looked right at her, and he said, Well, I suppose you're going to ask me whether or not I saw our Lord referring back to when he was critical. Uh, she was kind of stunned uh, for a second, and she said, well, did you? And he said, yes. And she said, well, what was he doing? He says, he was, he was doing what he always does. What's that? Well, he was singing, and he was dancing, and he was laughing. She said, was that it? No, he was also teaching us. And then his eyes drifted over to the corner of the room and he was staring at something. And his wife said, he's here right now, isn't he? And her husband said, yes. And he says that I'm to tell you no more. Now you can make whatever you want of that. But the hope is that all this is for real. Is for real. And the idea that there is anything at all after this life is pretty huge. But, but the, the idea that after this life there's a party, that there's singing and dancing and laughing and teaching, that is incredible, amazing news. And for those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, that is what is awaiting us. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4, describes it like this. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Here's the thing about that. Sometimes that's just not good enough. I don't know about you, but sometimes we go to church and we hear about heaven and how wonderful it is and think, oh, that, 
That sounds nice, okay? But what about right now? What about today? Today is when I could use a little bit of good stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, so one of these days there will be no more crying. That sounds great. But today I'm so depressed I didn't even feel like getting out of bed this morning. Uh, one of these days there'll be no more dying. Wonderful. But right now I'm sitting in an ICU with a loved one who has hoses running in and out of their body and I'm staring at a beeping screen. And someday no more loneliness. That sounds awesome. I can't wait. But you know what? Today, shit would be nice to have somebody around. Or someday there'll be this party that will never ever end. Fabulous. But today, I feel like a G.I. Joe that got put in a microwave oven just to feed him. So what are you supposed to do with Easter on a day like that? What do you do when you're when you're feeling that way, you just say, well, it's too bad I'm not dead. You know, if I was dead, I'd be living it up right now, apparently. Jesus says, no. What if, what if I told you that eternal life is something that does not begin after we die? What if I told you that eternal life begins now? What if I told you that eternal life is not something that's just for heaven? that it is for this life right here today. Uh, I, I met a guy one time uh, years ago who uh, did a lot of ministry in nursing homes. I, I hope this story doesn't upset anybody. Uh, I hope not. It, I'm just going to tell you like it is, okay? Uh, he said that the people he worked with in the nursing home there, he said these people are really excited about two things. They're looking forward to two things. He said they're, they're, they're looking forward to dying and going to heaven. They want to see all their friends and family and stuff. And he said, and they're excited about going to the toilet. They're, and they talk about both of those things a lot every day. If dead yet? No, not dead yet. Gone to the toilet today? No, not yet today. Working on it. And, and, and that's what they look forward to. And, and my guy says, you know, there has to be something there has to be something between the toilet and heaven for these people. And it made it his mission to find out what that was. And Jesus would agree. Jesus says that uh, eternal life is not something that happens after we die. Nowhere in the gospel is there a single place where Jesus says it happens after you die. It's, it happens when we meet Jesus because of our relationship with him that we experience it now. In fact, this would surprise probably some people out there, but Jesus very seldom talked about heaven. Just a couple few times, maybe. But not that, Jesus did not talk about heaven half as much as we do. Jesus talked about this world. He talked about this life. This life is where we are meant to experience eternal life. Not just someday, but now. I, uh, I, this was the best illustration that, that I could think of. Um, it's sort of like chocolate rabbits. When I was a kid, I used to get chocolate rabbit for Easter. And it seemed like back then they were huge. They'd be like the size of my little brother. And I would take that thing out with both hands and, and chomp down on that thing's ears. And it, it was hollow. It would it'd always be hollow. And I thought, well, what a ripoff. And then I, the, I don't know how old I was when I found out that not all chocolate rabbits are hollow. They make chocolate rabbits that are solid chocolate. And they have them at the very same store. You don't have to go to the specialty shop in Columbus. They got them right there on the same Shelf, and I heard about that. I, they got solid milk chocolate rabbits, and here I am eating this air rabbit. And complete, and and uh, you know, why 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 do parents do that to their children? I wondered. When I uh, when my kids were little, I used to tell them that the rabbit is hollow uh, to remind us of the empty tomb. Um, the <laughs> 
No, no, uh, no, no, I never said that. Uh, that would be bad. Uh, but uh, you, if you're a kid here today, we still got some kids in here today. If you're a kid and you got a chocolate rabbit for Easter and it's hollow, you need to tell your parents to go back to the store. Tell them, go back to the store. Tell them, tell them, Pastor Mike, tell them, Pastor Mike told you to say that. What do I care if they get mad at me, right? I'm leaving. I'm leaving. But, but, the message of Easter is we don't have to be hollow. We can be full. We can be solid. We can be rich. We can live a life that's eternal here. So, so I thought about that this week, and I thought, well, oh, that sounds good, you know, theologically or whatever, but what, what does that actually mean? I mean, what is it that Jesus actually does for us, like on Monday, that makes this life any different than, than it would be otherwise. And I, this is what I thought. I think he gives us power. I think he gives us a power that's beyond our own a power to, to face life. I don't know. If you're like me, does, you look around, does it seem to you like a lot of people are just tired? You ask people, how you doing? Tired. Tired. Work. Tired. of Winter. Just just tired. You go to Walmart and you look around at the people with the faces are sliding down. You see these young mothers pushing the cart with the little kid in the cart and the little kid screaming his head off and the mother is just like go ahead and scream. I just don't even care anymore. And you can just feel the, the weariness, the, the tired. And, and I've long been sort of fascinated by the, by the fact that, uh, that this thing has become a multi-million dollar industry in this country, these energy drinks. These energy drinks are everywhere. There's all kinds of them. And apparently, there's a lot of people in the world that are just finding it difficult to stay awake all day. Uh, so, uh, I got one. Believe it or not, this is true, believe it or not, I have never had one of these things before today. I had one at West Franklin, but it was a different one. And uh, I thought, I will just try one of these things, see, see what they are. So, this is called Monster. Smells like rock star. I'm still tasting the first one. Oh. It's all yours, darling. God bless you. Woo! Oh, that's a pain that lingers. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have anything against those drinks. You know, I, there's, there's nothing wrong with them. I, there have been weeks where I've considered passing those things out to you before church. <laughs> <laughs> Could not hurt. Uh, but I know that, the, that they're limited. You know, a, a drink might be able to perk you up a little bit in the afternoon, but, but there's no drink in the world that can wake you up in the morning and, and make you feel like this is a new beginning. Uh, there's no drink in the world that can make you know that your life has a purpose, that you're here for a reason. There's no drink in the world that can give you hope, that can help you find passion for, for living. There's no drink in the world that can help you keep the faith, uh, to keep believing, to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and, and do it again. No drink in the world can do any of that stuff, but the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is at work in you, and it is available to you, and that's eternal life. One more thing I just want to talk about real quick. Uh, I just want to look at the scripture again. Uh, the Gospel of John uh, loves little symbols and little references, and uh, there is so much in this story that there's no way that I could possibly talk about it all in one day. But I did want to lift up just one little detail. When uh, Mary Magdalene comes to the garden and she sees the risen Christ for the first time, she thinks he's the what? 
the gardener. When you're reading the Bible and you hear about a garden, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The, the, not the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Eden. Yeah, Garden of Eden. Back in the very beginning, that's when everything was good, everything was right. And then we sort of uh, messed up, we sort of blew it, and that's when sin entered the world, is when uh, corruption entered the world, shame and humiliation entered the world, and we were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And that's the book of Genesis. And then you skip ahead in the Bible to here to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John begins with the exact same words that the book of Genesis begins with. In the beginning. So John wants us to be thinking about Genesis throughout his gospel. And now we come to the end of the gospel where Jesus is resurrected. And where is he resurrected? In a garden. I don't think that's any accident. And I think, I think that when Mary Magdalene thinks that Jesus is the gardener, I think in a way, she's right. I think that Jesus is the gardener. I think Jesus is replanting the Garden of Eden right here. That's, that's what Easter is doing, making all things new. Gardening, it's spring. A lot of you are going to be gardening. I can't do it. I, I, I've tried. I'm, I'm a herbicidal maniac. I can't grow anything. I can't grow mildew in the tub. Can't grow anything. I somebody last year in the church gave me uh, a banana plant, a banana tree. That's what they're supposed to look like. And I tried. I watered it. I, I kept it in the sunlight. I did everything it's supposed to do. This is what mine looks like. <laughs> and if it doesn't perk up in a couple, three months, I'm just going to throw it away. <laughs> I just don't have it, but some of you can, you know, some of you can get out there and you get on your hands and knees until your back hurts and you dig in the dirt until you're sweaty and filthy and, and you, some of you mix in things that are disgusting, like manure and compost, rotten garbage, and you mix it up, you put seeds in there and, and you tend to it, but pretty soon you have a garden, you have something to look at, maybe better, something to eat, and it's like new life sort of right sort of like new life and Jesus is the gardener and he is making new life out of dirt out of nothing he is replanting the garden of Eden and he's doing it right here around us in our lives in our world today where eternal life begins so let's pray